Hello again and welcome. You can see I'm life cycle testing another meter. This one happens to be the Keysight U1231A. You may remember the meter from a previous video where I had cycle tested it using the transient generators and unfortunately I had damaged the meter and I was unable to repair it. So I ended up running it on our half cycle line simulator and I damaged some of the traces on the circuit board and unfortunately one of the pads on the rotary switch was damaged. So I pulled the meter out the other day to have a look at it and it appeared that just one pad of that whole switch was actually damaged. So I carefully just cleaned that up with some ProClean and then I removed the contact wiper from the rotary switch that actually rode across that bad spot of the circuit board. Basically I was trying to not create some kind of a fiberglass carbon dust that may cause rapid erosion on the other pads. So that contact is completely out of this meter the way it's running. Now this meter didn't have any lubrication on it. I've taken some close-up pictures again of what that switch looks like along with the contacts and I'll just attach these into the video. So in the meantime, all we have to do now is just let this thing cycle. Again, I'm using my bench meter to record the resistance of the meter. And this meter is the same way, I've just attached a couple of pieces of wire wrap wire. I ran them out of the battery compartment door. And again, the idea there is that we don't want to put any kind of stress on the case. Our Agilent meter now has about 5,000 cycles on it. And you can hear it starting to squeak. Let me just move the camera closer. Well, sounds like it's grinding as well. Now, again to be clear we removed the one contact that would have been riding over that area of bad circuit board. Looks like there's 20 more to go. Here the knob has a slight grind to it. And that's it. So that was 50,000 cycles. So this meter doesn't include a fuse because it doesn't have a way to measure current. So this is all open so it was pretty easy just to put a little piece of tape down there. Just kind of strain and relieve the wires and then just run them out this cover. Right here you can see the contact that I had removed. That's the one that uh, was actually damaged that rode over that bad spot on the circuit board. Oh this isn't good. There is no clicking at all on that mechanism completely wore out. Well the contacts themselves don't look too bad but look at the little springs here that they've got in there. You know and I'm not seeing a lot of plastic in the knob area. You can see the black up here, this is where it had damaged the circuit board when I arced it, but you know that's not plastic residue. Switch doesn't look in very good condition either. Looks like the pad surfaces are tore up pretty bad. Almost looks like maybe here it took a nick out of it. 
again these contacts here were not cycled uh, so those are going to be in still original condition yeah, some of these down here that looks pretty bad let me take some pictures of this under the microscope and we'll have a look at it you can see in the center of the screen this is one of the spring contacts and you can tell there's a crack right inside of the arc let's just have a look at another one again right in the center of the screen right there is the crack So this is why the springs aren't working anymore. I'm kind of surprised that they would have used a plastic that would break that quick. Actually, when we looked at the fluke meter, even after 50,000 cycles, there was no signs of any damage to the spring or any of the plastic in that area. Here you can see that it's actually rubbed some of the outside case. You can see some deterioration in the plastic. We didn't see anything like that with the fluke. Again, it looks like right in the center of the screen. Yeah, it definitely looks like a crack. Seems like all four of them are probably broke. There was a little bit of confusion last time I ran this test when we were looking at the log log and the histogram plots. So I've changed the software slightly and that's all under the post processing area here. So let's go ahead and we'll load up the files that we have so far. So this is looking at all the data sets. Again the Agilent is in the white. So I'm planning on changing the file names. So now you can see I have the manufacturer name, the part number of the meter, UL for unlubricated, D in this case would be for damaged. The fluke would be listed as a used meter, and the Cassun test would be listed as new. We can see the Agilent meter here is in white. We can see that it reached 1,000 ohms fairly quickly. If I just uh, disable some of the other meters, this is the Cassun test in yellow, and then the white again is our Agilent meter. So let's have a look at these in three dimensions. And again, this is our Syntec meter and this is where I had aborted the test at about 17,000 cycles. Here's our Agilent meter. You could see it reached 1,000 ohms right on the front end and then it basically quieted back down. Again this is our Cassun test meter. It also reached 1,000 ohms fairly quickly and then it also improved and then it gradually decayed again and this again is looking at the fluke meter and you can see just how much improved this is you can see the scaling it never obviously reached a thousand ohms it's just very flat let's go ahead and we'll auto scale so now you can see i'm looking at basically 0.358 which would have been our minimum up to one ohm and now let's have a look at our 3d slice again this is our fluke meter here's the centac meter again the majority of the time it's above one ohm Here's our baseline. This is the Agilent meter. Here's our Cassun test. And back to the fluke. So let's go ahead and look at our histograms. And so I've changed this slightly. 
you can see now that instead of just drawing a line chart I'm drawing these as bar graphs and the reason I'm doing that is to show the actual bin sizes so let's just zoom in a little bit further so now you could clearly see each bin and so again the white is the Agilent meter and this yellow here is our Cassun test this blue is the fluke meter so what I do now is just change our bin size so let's just cut this in half what you're gonna see is each bar graph is gonna double in width we'll cut it in half again and of course this is also changing the amplitude so let's just auto scale our Y and you can see so at this point here the fluke had filled this bin about 11,000 cycles there's about uh, 38 or so hundred here maybe about 1800 here you can see our Agilent meter is just down here in the muck it has a lot of bins and each one of those bins is you know between 500 and it looks like about 800 cycles so all those little bins would add up of course we could slide through this and you can see there's no information out here until we get up to around our one ohm cut point and then again we have quite a bit of data there again we can add more bins as well so let's go ahead and we'll just take that to 10,000 bins let's just re-zoom into the vertical so now we can see the bin sizes are quite a bit smaller but again if we zoom in even further you can see that all the bin sizes are basically the same What's interesting again about this is all the information for the fluke is right in this area right here. It all resides in this one peak. So let's go back to our 2D plot and let's take a look at our log log data now. So again we're going to plot all the way up to our 50,000 cycles. So what I've done here is I've changed this to now scan all the way down to 1 milliohm. Uh, prior to this I was scanning to 5 milliohms and basically what you saw for the fluke was a solid line going across the top so now with it scanning all the way down to one milliohm we can actually see some data for the fluke so if we're looking at the fluke you can see it's a little over 300 cycles before we saw one milliohm error and again this is looking at the deviation from the initial resistance so again we can see the fluke all the way to the 50,000 cycles this red plot here is our Agilent and again we can see it failed pretty close to what our Cassun test meter did there are some slight improvements when we get up into the 0.1 ohm range. You can see the Cassun test had failed at about 3,000 cycles, and it looks like our Keysight meter had failed up at about 6,000 cycles. But again, the fluke is all the way up here at 50,000 cycles, and it still never hit that 0.1 ohm. So the fluke is definitely the superior meter out of the ones I've looked at so far. Now, again, to be clear, you know, that Keysight meter was damaged. But again, I wasn't exercising that section of the rotary switch. So if I ran the exact same meter that was brand new, would we see the same results? My guess is yes. Um, I can't believe that removing that one contact would have that much of an effect. And it looked like the rest of the contacts were fine when I checked them under the microscope. And again, I spent some time cleaning up those contacts before I ran the test. So, yeah, I don't believe that running another one is going to make much of a difference. And again, looking at some of those pictures, you could just see how the plating had been stripped away after, you know, several cycles. And no matter what, that's not going to explain the fact that the spring contacts had cracked. So there's definitely something going on with that. So I hope you enjoyed seeing the Keysight meter being life cycled. And again, boy, nothing left of those springs. And again, just to recap, when I had transient tested this meter, this one failed at 5,000 volts with a 100 microsecond full width half height and a 2 ohm source impedance. The Fluke 17B Plus failed with a 10,000 volt transient with a 50 microsecond full width half height. Now again, this meter had survived all the transients that were applied to this meter. I had just taken it up to the second transient generator to push it at higher levels. So it actually took two times the voltage level to get this meter to fail.
And of course, when we life cycle tested the switch on this, the switch has now 50,000 cycles plus on it. And you saw the switch was just flawless almost on this meter. You know, there's some slight wear, but you know, it's nothing like any of these other meters that I've looked at. Now again, they didn't place the vias inside of the pads on this meter, so at least they got that part of it right. But boy, that plating is just wearing right down. And I think that's why early on we started to see the switch go intermittent. So yeah, I don't think that this Keysight meter is even in the same class as what this Fluke is. Well, I think that's going to be all for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Looks like we've picked up quite a few new followers. Glad to have you on board. So my plan is to eventually run a Bryman meter. Hopefully we'll do that in the near future. And again, that's really the whole reason I'm putting this series of videos together for the life cycling. Again, there were just posts that I'd seen out on the forums about the Bryman meter and, and what was really the expected life of this type of meter. And I definitely want to find out how this compares against a meter like a Fluke. So stay tuned and we'll run that test eventually. Well, until the next test, later.